Welcome again, our prayer partners. Good morning, good afternoon to those who are in the afternoon season, and uh, good evening <laughs> to those who are in the night season, like myself. I want to thank God for the opportunity to be here once again. This is our most delightful hour where we come to study the word of God and we come to pray to bless our day. Praise the name of the Lord. I'm calling in from Washington in the Pacific Northwest. Here we unlock your destiny through the word and through prayer. That is the commission that we have. So I want to invite you so that you can pray with us. It is always an honor and a blessing to have you partner with us from whatever corner of the globe you're calling us from. And uh, I want to thank God so much for giving us the opportunity every day, even as I celebrate that it is by the grace of God that we are able to preach. It's by the grace of God we are able to pray. It's by the grace of God we are able to move and to have our being. So we don't take it for granted any morning that we get a chance to come here. Good morning, Dr. Pali. Oh, good afternoon. I know it's afternoon in India. <laughs> good to see you, woman of God. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure and a joy to have you on the prayer line. I want to welcome all of you that uh, pray with us and those who are also logging in for the first time. This is known as Blessing Your Day Prayer Altar. This is an altar where we come and spend at least one hour every day agreeing together by studying the Word of God and by praying together because we believe that there is power in prayer and we believe that the Word of God is the final authority. The Word of God has all the answers to what you need. I know that sounds controversial, but that is the truth and you cannot change it. I said here the day before yesterday, or maybe, yeah, maybe, is it the day before yesterday? Yes. Um, you can, no, it was yesterday. You can refuse to accept the word of God, just like um, some people can decide to refute the laws of gravity. But you see, refuting the laws of gravity doesn't change them. And the effects doesn't change. It's the same. People can ignore the word of God, but that doesn't change the principles, the precepts, and the outcomes. <laughs> the word of God is there. It will not change. The Bible says it's established. The foundations are established before. I mean, the word of God was established before the foundations of the earth because the word of God is Christ himself. So it's good when you desire to love God and to know his word. Good morning, Sister Carol Meso. Good to see you, my sister. Uh, evangelist, how are you? Sister Beth King, good morning. My friend, Sister Rose Ngure, God bless you. I was about to call you <laughs> and ask you if I need to repent because I have missed you. Anyway, it's good to see you, my sister. I've, I've actually been thinking about you, God knows. Uh, that I was about to find out what happened to you and where you are. So it's good to see you this morning. Welcome. Thank you, Oge TV. We love you so much. Good to see you, my friend. Thank you so much for tuning in. Those who are on YouTube, thank you so much. Please help me share the broadcast so that we can have more people getting blessed. We are doing a very important study and... Uh, uh, one of the things that I love so much about what God has been speaking to us the last few weeks, we've been talking about keeping the fire of God burning. We've been talking about the spirit-filled church, which is made up of spirit-filled believers. And uh, we, are, we, are, we are just wondering, how can we be on fire for Christ? <laughs> Thank you, Sister Rose. God bless you. Now, um, I'll tell you something. If you want to know about someone, or if you want to know someone, because I differentiate between knowing about someone and knowing someone. Some of you know about Pastor Zippy, and some of you know Pastor Zippy just like she does. You can't know someone unless you are interacting with them at very close quarters. And one of the things that people don't seem to realize is that if you want to know God, not just know about God, 
I think everybody in the world, atheists included, everyone knows about God, but not everybody knows God. If you want to know God, don't look for him in your in your in your in the prophecies that are being said there in your locality. Don't look for him in books. Don't look for him in astrology. Don't look for him in divination. God has expressed himself in totality. The part he wanted us to know him because we know him in part. We don't know him. Even those of us that have been born again for many years, we don't really know him all. He has just revealed a part of himself, but that part is what he wants us to know. The only way to know God is to interact with him. And you interact with him by reading and studying his word and by prayer. Those are two things. And of course, worship. Those are three things that are very important in the life of a believer. So thank you so much for desiring to know the word of God because the word of God is God himself and the word of God reveals who God is. Somebody has been challenging me for some time now and uh, I think I better take up the challenge because somebody has been telling me to write, to start writing books and um, telling me that all these messages I have preached all through the years, this is somebody who knows me for some time and they know my Christian work and they've been challenging me to put every, what I've been preaching in books or in a book or whatever. And I fully agree because all that information, if I want it preserved, the best way is to put it in a book. Please pray for me. <laughs> I need to publish a book or books. So God was so good to us that he did not leave us guessing who he is. He didn't leave us, <laughs> thank you, Sister Rose. He didn't leave us wondering how to know him. If I'm right, and Dr. Pali, maybe you can check for me. I think somewhere in uh, Romans chapter 10, there's a place it's, it says, we don't have to go up to look for him. We don't want have to go down to search him because the word of faith is in our mouth. I think it's somewhere in Romans chapter 9 or 10 around there. I can't recall very well, but I know. So God did not leave us wondering how to know him. And let me tell you, the reason Christ came Christ did not just come because we needed to be saved. I would like to also tell you something extra. Christ came to reveal God. You know, Christ was manifested in the flesh so that his life is a demonstration of who is God. So if you want to know God, You've got to study Christ. For those who are relatively new in studying the Bible, let me tell you, and those of you that like doing evangelism, because I'm trained in evangelism, uh, Dr. Pali and I, that's where we met, we are being taught about how to evangelize the world. If you preach to a new believer and they give their life to Christ, let me give you one of the strongest ways of them starting to know Christ. Of all the 66 books of the Bible, when you preach to somebody and they get saved, recommend them to read the Gospel of John as the first book of the Bible. Okay, are you hearing me? You know I'm a Bible school teacher, by the way. Most of you don't know. I, I used to lecture in our, <laughs> in our Bishop's Bible, Bible College. Um. The best book to start reading to know Christ is the Gospel of John. And it starts with these words. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Who was that talking about? It was talking, it is talking about Jesus Christ. 
praise the name of the Lord. So when you encounter somebody who doesn't know about Christ and you want to introduce them to knowing Christ, please introduce them from the Gospel of John because the Gospel of John is the one that shows the deity, the deity, the godliness, the godly nature of Christ. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there are four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We call Matthew, Mark, and Luke the synoptic Gospels. Synoptic in that they are very similar. The synoptic means seeing together. So the records of Matthew, Mark, and uh, Luke are similar. But the Gospel of John is a little different because the Gospel of John demonstrates the deity of Christ. The other Gospels have both the date, not that, not that, uh, please don't get me wrong, all the books of the Bible have about the, the nature of Christ as a man and the nature of Christ as God. So the book that describes the nature of God in Christ best is the Gospel of John. So Whenever you want to know about God, even you who is probably new in the Bible, read the Gospel of John and read all of it. It records a number of miracles that only God can do. It records the resurrection of the dead. It records the healing of the blind. It records the lame walking. Those are things that only God could do and only God can do. There is nobody on this earth who can heal a cripple except God. So Jesus did not come just to restore our relationship to Christ, to, uh, to God. Jesus came to reveal God to us. That's why we believe in him. He asked, uh, Philip asked him, <laughs> In John chapter 14, somewhere, Philip said, show, show us the Father. <laughs> and Jesus said, Philip, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Don't wait to see another God. Don't wait to see another Father. Thank you so much, Dr. Pali. I need to read that. Romans chapter 10, verse 6. So I know I was talking about that God did not leave us uh, without knowing where to get him or how to know about him or how to know him. He did tell us, yes, I knew it's Romans chapter 10, but I could remember the verse. This is what the Bible says in Romans 10, 6, and I want to proceed because we are talking about the word of God. The Bible says, uh, but the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. And then verse 7 says, oh, who will descend into the abyss or hell or the grave? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? Verse 8, the word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. And verse 9 says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. How are you, Brother Simon? Praise the name of Jesus. Are you hearing? God did not leave us in a vacuum where we have to go to heaven to bring Christ, or we have to go to hell to bring him up from the dead. But he's already risen. He's with us. That's why you believe in your heart. Then you confess with your mouth that Christ is Lord and you are saved. Praise the name of the Lord. Now, how do you hide the word? How do you how do you have faith in your heart if you're not reading the Bible to know what it says? Because you store in your heart whatever you receive. So I welcome you guys, my friends, my partners. I love you. Thank you for learning to know the word of God. So I want to finish what I started yesterday. I thought I would finish it yesterday, but I did not finish. And I didn't want to ignore it because the Holy Spirit kept on prodding me to continue uh, so that I finish because I have finished. So we are talking about the spirit-filled believer who makes up the spirit-filled church. And I'll keep on insisting here. Stop looking for a spirit-filled church. 
You are the one who's supposed to be spirit filled so that you put that church on fire. The Bible says when the fire and the Holy Spirit came on the, on the apostles and the 120 in the upper room, they are the ones who made the church. And that church was on fire for Jesus. Eh? They did not go looking for another church. Praise the name of the Lord. You know, nowadays we have a problem with the believers of nowadays. Some of them have foot and mouth disease. They can't rest in one church. They go to every new church in the city. Something is wrong with you if you can't settle down. I know that's not a gospel some of you like to hear, but I'll speak it here because I like when we talk to mature people. <laughs> sister Raquel, how are you? Good to see you, my sister. Say hi to my family. So I want to finish what I started yesterday. I'm talking about now that we are looking for a, a fire filled and Holy Ghost filled and a church that is on fire for Jesus. And the Lord has been teaching us that a church that is going to be on fire for Jesus, it's going... <laughs> It's going to be a church that loves the doctrine of the apostles. It loves the word of God. So as a believer, you must love the word of God. Uh -huh. Welcome, Sister Mary Mushira. Sister Raquel, you're laughing. Yeah, there are some people in church. They can't stay somewhere. They have to. And then they have those are the same people who gossip so much. That's why they leave this church, go to this church, go to this one. They speak bad about every church. So me, I tell them they have foot and mouth disease. And such people need to be quarantined. The animals that used to have foot and mouth disease used to be quarantined somewhere. God have mercy. Hallelujah. <laughs> okay. A spirit-filled church loves the word of God, right? And how do we love the word of God? By reading it. So if you want to tap into the power, you have to be connected to the source of the power. And the source of the power can only come by you studying that word. You know why I confidently pray for healing without doubting? Me, I never doubt. I pray believing that God's perfect will and wisdom shall be done. And I have seen people recover. I have seen others pass on, like my auntie just passed on two weeks ago. I've been praying for her for close to a year. In his wisdom, God knows why he allows that to happen. But that doesn't stop me from praying or believing. Praise the name of the Lord, because I know God heals. And I said, I will go to the grave saying God heals because I know he heals. The reason I have that confidence is because the word of God tells me that healing is the children's bread and it is the will of God to heal. So now, yesterday we looked at how to tap into that power and why we need to tap into it. We say, number one, read and study the word. Now, why do we need to study the word? That's what I, I want to summarize. First of all, you study the word because God's word or the Bible is God's word to you. God has written you his word. Whenever I write something, you read, don't you? Because Pastor Zip is your friend. The same way God has written. So based on the fact that it's God who has inspired the Bible, and you love him and he's your friend, it's good to read the word of God. Praise the name of Jesus. Number two, why do we need to read the Bible? The Bible is reliable and the Bible is not, I mean, is inerrant. It has no error. Welcome, Sister Francisca. God bless you. I will need to keep in touch. I actually drafted a message halfway. I was supposed to send you, then I stopped. I don't know why, but I'll get in touch. Uh, listen, the word of God is reliable and the word of God has no error. Amen? Because when it was written, it was not written by a man. I clarified here yesterday and I want to repeat it. The Bible was authored by the Holy Spirit not by the men who wrote it. The men published it. If you understand, when I write a book, I am the author. 
but the person who writes it and makes it up is known as the publisher. Moses and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Peter and Mark and Luke and Paul and John, they are the publishers, but the author of the Bible is the Holy Ghost. That is why the Holy Ghost, because he is the same Holy Spirit who spoke to Moses thousands of years ago, he's the same Holy Spirit who spoke to Malachi 400 years before Jesus was born. He's the same Holy Spirit who spoke to Paul more than 60 years after Christ had uh, risen from the dead. That Holy Spirit, that is why the Bible written so many thousands of years apart, it has a flow. Written by over 40 people. Let me tell you something. I don't know how many we are online to do. Okay, I can see about 17 people on Facebook Live. God bless you. If I tell you to write about Pastor Zipporah, all of you will write something about Pastor Zippy. But their chances are that not everything will be the same. But the Bible, there is no error anywhere. It flows so well that indeed you must ask yourself, how can 40, more than 40 authors writing at different times and thousands of years apart, how can they write the same thing? How can Isaiah write that an, a virgin will be a with a child and call him Emmanuel, Isaiah 7, 14, and then a girl 400 years, I mean 700 years later is born in Nazareth, and before she gets married to a man called Joseph, she gets pregnant and she gives birth to a boy and she calls him Emmanuel. Sincerely speaking, there must be a supernatural being behind that thing. So the Bible is inerrant and the Bible is reliable. Welcome, Auntie Esther. Good to see you. Thanks, Sister Lucy Mwangi. <clears throat> okay, number three. So today I have to finish. I have to use those remaining 17 minutes very quickly so that I can finish. If you look at your notes, I have given you the summary. I like summarizing it for you because let me open my let me open my 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 phone over here so that I can I can accompany you. I like using my phone also because I can see the post. Now, if you look at number three, let me put the media down so that it doesn't start talking here while I'm talking. Praise the name of the Lord. If you look at the reason number three I've given you is because the Bible is relevant now as it was when it was written. Why do I say that? Because I need to explain a little bit why I need uh, why, why I say that the Bible is relevant. Let me tell you, there are two things that have not changed throughout time. The nature of God has not changed and the nature of man has not changed. Please understand that. Let that sink in your mind. The nature of God does not change, and the nature of man does not change. What do I mean? For example, technology changes, but man and his desires do not change. Do you know whether you are talking about somebody who lived 3,000 years ago or somebody who lives now? Every man that has lived on the face of the earth has been seeking satisfaction. Everybody. That's a nature that does not change. <laughs> Every man on the face of the earth, and when I say man, I mean both gender, female and male. Everyone desires to be loved. That's a nature of man. So because God does not change and the nature of man does not change, the Bible is relevant and applicable as it was when it was written and as it is today. So if it provided answers that time, even now, it is the answer. One of the best books you should read if you want to know about the issues of life, it is known as Proverbs. And another one after Proverbs is known as Ecclesiastes. You see, Ecclesiastes was written by Solomon. But let me tell you something about Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes was written by Solomon when he was backslidden. 
<laughs> so some of the things he has written there are very interesting, but it is the truth and it is wisdom. One of the scriptures in Ecclesiastes, I think it should be Ecclesiastes 1.9, is it? Yes, it says, there is nothing new under the sun. You know, today <laughs> we have our children wearing jackets that are torn with holes everywhere and legs and they are fashion. Do you know that in our days when we were growing up, if you wore like that, we said you are cuckoos, you are nuts. Wear a shirt with holes that is, you know, but that's the fashion today. What am I trying to say? <laughs> those shirts and those trousers you are seeing cut everywhere with holes, they are fashionable right now, but they are not new, my friend. They were there. It's only that the concept has come in a different way, but there's nothing new. The desires of man has never changed. Every man wants to reach God. Do you know every man wants to know the future? Who is here who doesn't know? Oh, let's speak the truth. Don't we all want to know what will happen tomorrow? I wish somebody can tell me what will happen tomorrow. But you know why I know what will happen tomorrow? Because the word of God gives me the answer. But why do you think people go to the diviners and the astrologers and the fortune tellers? Because they want to know about tomorrow. They want to know what will happen to their future. Because that is the nature of man. So the desires and the nature of man do not change. So beloved, stop looking for answers anywhere. Nothing is new today. Don't think because there's a lot of politics in Kenya today that it is new. No, it has always been like that. Only the, maybe only the degree has changed, but the nature and the desire and the reason behind why people are doing is the same. Am I talking to someone? So you need to read, the, to read and study the word of God because God is not changeable. Man is not changeable. I mean, the nature of man has not changed. And so because of that, you need to know that the Bible is relevant and it's applicable even today. God bless you. Number four, why do we need to read and study the Bible? Because in the world we are living in, how many people know that there are so many false teachings today? I think I need to emphasize that a little bit more. Today there are so many false teachings, so many. Especially now that we have this internet and everybody is free to get into this internet and say whatever they want to say. They have freedom of speech. They, in, in a country like this, eh, Sister Rose, in a country like this, we even come from Kenya fearing God. So, But then you hear somebody when they arrive in America, they say, it's my right. I was listening to one of my friends and they were saying, <laughs> people are people come to to that person for counseling here in this country. You know, Pastor Zippy is a counselor. By the way, I've done counseling as a profession. There are so many things I've done is only that I'm not practicing. My last training was a diploma in social sciences and counseling skills. Yes, I have an associate's degree that I did graduated in 2019. Now, and also, I'm a mental health coach. I'm actually finishing my certificate soon and very soon. And I'm a crisis counselor. So I know about counseling. People come to you for counseling. Then you tell them <laughs> what you think is right and what we know is right. Do you know, my friend was telling me that he's counseling somebody and they are supposed to be believers. So they're supposed to be referencing the Bible. Then they reference the Bible and they say something that is contrary to what this person wants. Then they start telling the person, it is my right. That is my right. Now I'm asking, why are you coming for counseling when we try to tell you, you say it's your right? Because there is another teaching that you know that you don't want to agree with the Bible. Good morning, son. I receive more grace. Eh? My friends, if you don't read the Bible, you... You, you, you. If you don't read the Bible for yourself, these preachers you are seeing, we shall mislead you if you are not careful. 
Because these are the last days. What does the Bible say in 2 Timothy chapter 3? Or is it 1 Timothy? Let me look for it. I think it's 1 Timothy. Let me read for you something because I've remembered. <laughs> oh, and I forgot to tell people our reference today. Our reference scripture today is 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 15. The Bible says, study to show yourself approved unto God. A man who doesn't need to be ashamed. Amen. Let me read it for you. It's here. 2 Timothy 2.15 is our scripture today. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Father, I pray that any time I sit on this chair and on this altar, I will divide the word of truth rightly by the help of the Holy Spirit, that I may never mislead anybody. That's my prayer. Thank you, Sister Rose. You got it. Yes. They say my truth instead of the truth. You see that word, the, those who have done English, the article, the, makes it very particular. That's why Jesus did not say, I am a way, a truth, and a life. He didn't say that because that means there's another option. He said, I am the way, the truth. And the life, meaning there is no other option. Jesus is the truth. He is not a truth among many. Thank God I'm a teacher and I know some good English. First Timothy chapter 3, listen. No, is it second or first? No, second Timothy chapter 3. Listen, I will read from verse 1 to 5. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. I want you to go check the meaning of the word perilous. Now, I want you to listen and tell me whether we are living in those days or not. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, Boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers. Oh, slanderers. Oh, may I say slanderers. And they are full in the church of Jesus Christ too. Without self-control, brutal, Despisers of good, of course, they call good evil and they call evil good, okay? Despisers of good. Traitors, I have been betrayed, so I know what it means to be to, to have a traitor around. Headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of of godliness, but denying its power. From such people, turn away. Do I need to tell you that we are living in those days? Did you hear some things that are so obvious and so evident today? And those things are there because people have a form of godliness but they deny the power that comes with godliness. And one of those powers they deny is the power to live a righteous and holy life. Oh, today you better not tell somebody that adultery is wrong, fornication is wrong. Sisters, moving around with somebody's husband is wrong. Brothers, moving around with somebody's wife is wrong. Leaders, swindling people's money when you have a position of authority is very wrong. Teachers, nurses, preachers, mothers, Fathers, whatever, whatever you are. 
This is a gospel that some of us cannot help preaching because we know we have tried it and it works. The problem we have, did you hear the word proud and haughty? We have so many people in the body of Christ that are so proud. You better not correct them. They are the first to say, don't judge. If you have no sin, pick the first stone. Nonsense. Stop misinterpreting the Bible. Calling sin out is not judgment. Let me help you how God helped me to explain to understand judgment. Because nowadays we can't say people are wrong because we are judging. Okay. When Christ sat at the church and he made the whip, did I preach to you here and I told you, go read it. Jesus did not ask for a whip. I am seeing him there so angry making a whip. What did he say? You have turned my father's house of prayer into a den of thieves and robbers. Can I say the church of Christ has almost become a den of thieves and robbers today? So Jesus was not supposed to say that. He was not even supposed to chase people from the church. He was not even supposed to turn the, the, the tables of the money changers. Thank you, Sister Rose. Those are the things that are literally happening today. So I want to caution you and tell you we are living in the last days. You know, the problem with you is because you think last days, last days, this last days from the beginning of P Peter and John. Oh, Jesus, my friend, the Bible says to God, 1,000 years is just like a day. Just get that concept into your head. Praise the name of the Lord. So judgment, listen, the woman of John chapter 8 was caught in adultery. And she was brought to Christ. The Lord helped me to understand through that episode what judgment is. When we call out sin, because Christ told that lady, go and sin no more. What does that tell you? That Christ acknowledged that the woman was living a sinful life. And he told her to stop doing what she was doing. Now, that's, the, that's why I understood judgment. Because the people who brought the woman to Jesus, they had already decided what should be done to her. She was supposed to be stoned. That is the judgment. I want to say this, and I want to make it very clear. When I say our leaders need to stop being corrupt and stop looting and stop uh, taking money from the government, we are not judging them. Me, I'm not judging them. I am not saying they be killed or they be hanged or they be what? That is not in my capacity. Are you hearing what I'm saying? But calling out the sin is my responsibility as a preacher of the word of God. And everybody has a right to, to tell me when I'm wrong. But you can't tell me I'll go to hell and you have already decided me I'm an, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, 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 I'm what? <laughs> Let me put it this way. There's a group that I belong to where we discuss a lot of hot politics. I saw somebody write, some of you, you are goats. You are goats. And your fate is decided. That is judgment. And I thought about it, I said, and the, whoever was saying that is, of course, a man of God. I said, this is so unfortunate. Because when Christ talked about the goats and the sheep in Matthew chapter 25, even Christ spoke in future tense. The Bible says, and the Lord and my father will tell them. Will tell them at that time. So right now you cannot decide who is going to hell. You. you. I hope I've explained myself. Sometimes, you know, I get tongue-tied because I want to get it to you. But I do believe the Holy Spirit is helping you to understand. 
So telling somebody to stop stealing or to stop gossiping and slandering people, because hmm? that is what is now the topic of the church. May God have mercy upon us. When we tell somebody to stop being proud, when we tell somebody to, to stop being unthankful, or when we enter their parents, that is not judgment, beloved. That is helping people to know the will of God. Judgment is when I tell that person that you are already doomed to hell. You, you are a candidate of hell. Who told you? I have said here again and again, everybody, including the worst criminal that you know, is a candidate for salvation. As long as Jesus' blood is still saving. That is Pastor Zippy. I will tell you with an attitude of love because I know if you repent and you turn from your wicked ways, God will forgive and he will forget. So you need to know that there's too much false teaching and the only way you can tell that correct teaching is to read the Bible. I like to say this. I hear nowadays in Kenya there is something known as wash wash where people make fake money. They print a lot of fake money notes. Do you know for you to know a fake note, you must know the original true note? How can you tell something is fake if you don't have the original? If you want to know whether a doctrine is correct, I charge you today, the only measure and standard is to read the Bible. Okay? That's the only measure of the truth. You can read all the books. I read so many books. But any book, whatever it tells me, I have to measure it with the word of God. And that's why yesterday I wrote to you the book of uh, Acts chapter 17, verse 11. The Bible says, the people of Berea, the believers who received Christ in Berea, they were no, more noble. I love that word, noble and the wiser than the believers in the Salonica. Because the believers in the Salonica, they received the word from Apostle Paul, they took the word, but the believers in Berea, after receiving the word from Paul, they would go to their homes, search the scriptures to confirm that what Paul was saying is true. I charge you here today in the name of Jesus with all honesty of heart. After I leave this altar, please go and read that Bible I have read to confirm that what I was reading for you is true. If you want to measure the truth, whenever you hear a preacher or you hear somebody or you hear whoever or you hear a philosophy or an idea, my friend, I beg you, measure it by the word of God. If it is not in line with the gospel, get it out of your life. It doesn't matter who has said it. It doesn't matter who has read it. It doesn't matter who has written it. Even if it is this Pastor Zippy of yours, I humble myself every day and I tell God, help me. Let the Bible be the blueprint of my life, the standard by which I measure everything. When I talk and I hurt somebody, I want to apologize and I want to go before God and ask him for forgiveness because that is not what I should do as a believer. I have allowed people to judge my dressing. Sisters, listen, me, I am that open. When I go to preach in a church, I tell people, judge my dressing. If you feel my dressing is not appropriate according to the standards of the word of God, I'm ready. Paul said, when I went to the Romans, I became like a Roman. When I went to the Jews, I became like a Jew. When I went to the Greeks, I, went, I became like a Greek. When I went to the barbarians, I became like a barbarian. Not adopting to their custom, but living in a way that I could win them. Let me say to you something. Today, if I go to Saudi Arabia, I will put on a hijab and I will dress like a Muslim. You know why? Because I want to win them to Christ. Does me putting a hijab make me a sinner? Some of you, it's my right. It's okay. I don't care. They can be stumbled. Shame on you. Read Romans chapter 14 and chapter 15. The Bible says, if you eat vegetables, another person eats meat, 
You who eat vegetables, don't stumble the one who eats meat. And you who eat meat, don't stumble the one who eats vegetables. Let us live in harmony and in unity and caring for one another. That's a hard gospel. It's not for babies. This is for the spiritually mature. And my time is almost up. How are you, my daughter, Sister Ann Johnson, and Brother Simon Courier? God bless you. The last two, and I better go very quickly. Thank you, Pastor Sister Rose. You should become a preacher, you. Yeah, we have to cooperate, but we can't compromise. Yeah, hold on to your values. Praise the name of the Lord. Long time, Sister Martha Solomon. God bless you. Now, the Bible says, okay, the last two points before I pray, I have only 15 minutes remaining. Uh, that was point number what? One, two, three, four, five. Number five. The reason we need to study, read and study the word of God so that we can be believers on fire for Christ and the church can be on fire for Christ is because the Bible equips us to serve. I want to say this and I have said it again and again and I'll say it again and again. It is so sad that you can take your child to a college and pay so much money because you want them to become a mechanical engineer or you want them to be an architect or you want them to be a nurse or you want them to be a medical doc or you want them to be a teacher or you want them to be whatever career. You pay a lot of money. And here is Pastor Zippy. I took my daughter to the most expensive schools right from kindergarten. She went to a very expensive kindergarten, my friend, even elementary school or primary school, all the way to college. She went to one of the most expensive colleges in Kenya, and I forfeited a lot of things to give her the best education. And I am ready to help her up to PhD level. I want her to go as far as she wants. That's how my dad told me. Dad was ready to support me go as far as I wanted with education, and I believe in the same policy. If I can go to those lengths to give my daughter the best education so that she can be the best musician because she's a music girl. My friend, what makes you think that you can sit around and not study the word of God? How will you ever know this God? How will you ever know what you need to do? The reason we take our kids to those beautiful schools and colleges and we pay so much is so that they can be equipped to be the best in their line of calling or their line of purpose. When I meet a nurse and one is a registered nurse RN and another one is a BSN, Bachelor of Science in Nursing. Whom do you think I think is more qualified anyway? Let's be honest. I think the BSN is better than the RN because of the qualifications. When I meet a lecturer in a university and one has a master's degree but another one has a PhD, which class do you think I would like to attend? I tend to think the PhD guy knows more than the, the, the master's guy, right? Because they have been skilled and equipped. When I went to the hospital in January last year, I was going in for surgery. I was very traumatized and I really, really didn't want to go through that procedure because that was my third admission in six months. But let me tell you, when I saw the, the, the surgeon, he's an old man called Dr. Safari. <laughs> he has been in this business for so many years. I'll tell you the truth. My spirit was lifted and I believed that he can't make a mistake. And when he talked to me and showed me why we need to do the procedure, it was a three and a half hour surgery. That's not a, a small thing. <laughs> but I want to give you my practical example. I like giving myself because me, I don't want to preach about the things people have shared with me. And pastors, you need to have good manners. 
<laughs> stop using people's examples to give ex to give examples here if they have not told you to do it. Yeah, be very careful. So that's why I like giving sometimes what I've gone through myself. So my, my point is simple. If you want to be equipped and to know God and to know how you're going to serve God and to know what you need to do so that you study to show yourself a workman approved unto God who does not need to be ashamed, please read the word of God. It has all the skills. It has all the knowledge, the wisdom, the understanding, everything you need to be equipped for the kingdom. Oh, glory be to God. And the last point, because I have 10 minutes and I have to finish in an hour. If you want to know another reason to read the Bible and study the word of God is the last one, simple, but very, very important. The Bible helps you to learn. Thank you, Sister Rosie. Yeah, let's, let's be real. You know, I don't like living in a utopian religious world. I like to be real because I'm human. <laughs> Thank you, dear. God bless. Uh, the Bible says, or rather, the Bible gives us examples of men and women who made mistakes and men and women who did right. How do you become a better person? Do you know that a mistake of somebody else is supposed to be a lesson for you? When you read about what happened to the man after God's heart, the man God was boasting about, who loved him with all his heart. But the day he took another man's wife, the Bible says, the sword shall never depart from your house. His son, his, uh, his son Amnon raped his daughter Tema. His other son Absalom held a grudge against Amnon. And um, Absalom uh, killed Amnon. Then the same Absalom decided to overthrow his government. Then that Absalom was killed by Joab and he brought grief to his father. That man is known as David. Another man whom God says, the meekest man on the face of the earth. Meek. Meek is more than humble. Meekness and humility are two different things. You can be humble, but you're not meek. The meekest man that ever lived on the face of the earth. The man who could fast, Sister Raquel, fast 80 days. You know people say Moses fasted 40 days. My friend, I read my Bible. He fasted 80 continuous days because after he came from the mountain with the two tablets and he found people had worshipped the cow, he got angry, he broke the... Do you know he went back another 40 days immediately? Go read your Bible. That meek man, one day he refused to do what God told him to do. Instead of talking to the stone, the rock, he hit it in anger. What happened? The Bible says, he did not enter Canaan. Oh my God, it was so sad. He could see it from far, but he could not enter. My friend, don't you make a mistake, then you miss the spiritual canon that we are looking forward to. Father, in the name of Jesus, I give you praise, glory, and honor this morning. Thank you for loving us so much that you have prepared a daily meal for us so that our souls, our spirits, and our bodies can be refreshed. Father, we thank you as we come to dine at this table every day. We find, oh, Jehovah God, that you have given us daily fresh manna. We receive it with thanksgiving and we seal that word with the blood of Jesus that it will bear fruit and fruit that will last. It will transform our lives, oh God. It will change our thinking. It will change our way of life. It will change, my Father, how we relate with people, how we deal with our children, how we, we behave at our places of work, how we carry around our spirituality, Jehovah God. We want to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we want to thank you because of this wonderful, wonderful time that you give us every day. We receive with thanksgiving all the brethren that 
tune in now and in the days to come, Jehovah God. I know we have all come here with the needs. We have come with the requests. We have come with desires. We have come, Jehovah God, with the uh, 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 visions and dreams of what we ought to be and what we ought to do in these few days that you've given us on earth. I pray that this word will open our mind and give us understanding. It will shine our path, Jehovah God, so that we can walk in the light of the kingdom of God. And this word, Jehovah Father, will help us to know you and know you well. Know you because you have revealed yourself to us because you are a God who cares so much. You love us so much. You have a good plan for each and every person that has been, uh, that is still alive, Jehovah. We want to thank you. Father, on this altar we come here because we believe in your word. We believe in prayer. We believe in worship and we believe in the fellowship of believers. As we gather from whatever corner of the earth we are in today, I thank you because this is the day you have made. This day we are glad and we rejoice in it. And we believe, Jehovah Father, that it is the day you have preserved us and given us life that we may demonstrate the power of God wherever we are. That's why I pray, Lord, may you anoint us afresh. Holy Spirit of God, come and cohabit with us. Come and live in us. Come and take over. Come and guide us. Come and counsel us. Come and lead us. We want to know the will of the Father. We want to know the mind of God. We want to know what Jehovah God you want us to do so that we may not fall short of your glory. And even where we have fallen short of your glory, Father, we repent this morning and we ask for forgiveness in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Lord, I want to thank you because of every need that is presented on this altar this morning. The needs of healing, the needs of restoration, the needs of finances, the needs of broken marriages, the needs, my father, of rebellious children, the needs of good leadership, the needs, Jehovah Father, of our own, own inner needs that we can't even say before people. I agree with my sisters and my brothers, Jehovah, that your perfect will be done and your kingdom come in our lives. Lord, we trust you. Some trust in horses, others in chariots, but we trust in the name of Jehovah God of Israel. We declare like David, Jehovah God, the enemy may come with a spear and a shield, but we come in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the God of the armies of Israel. Jehovah Sabaoth is our God. We declare this morning, Jehovah Rapha, you are our God. I pray that you heal our bread and heal our water. Heal the air, Jehovah God, and heal the land. Heal my father, the trees and the grass of the field. Heal the animals in the wild and the domestic animals, Jehovah God. Heal our marriages, our Father, and heal our finances. Heal our jobs, Jehovah God, and heal our businesses in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray for our children. May they live to love you, Lord. May they live to know you, Jehovah. May you help us to pass this gospel to our children. Lord, I pray that we shall teach them in the morning, in the noontime, in the evening. We shall teach them as we sit down, as we rise up, as we do our regular businesses. Forgive us the many times, Father, that we have failed to pass this gospel to the next generation. But we are trusting you, King of glory, that there is nothing too hard for you. Lord, I pray for every expectation of the hearts of your people. Whatever we are trusting you for this week, Jehovah, we receive it in advance with thanksgiving, for there is nothing too hard for you. You are the God of all flesh. You said we call unto you, and you will show us great and mighty things that we have not seen. Our Father, I pray, let your perfect will be done. Let the will of heaven be done. Let your purpose be accomplished today. In the name of Jesus, we decree that our going out and our coming in is blessed. Our rising up, our sitting and our lying down is blessed. We are blessed in the morning, blessed in the noontime, blessed in the evening and blessed in the nighttime. In the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, we pray and we believe. Amen and amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Sorry, I have to cut short because I'm trying to keep the discipline of time, one hour, and I can see I have only a minute remaining. But thank you so much, beloved. Continue to grow. May the guide you in all that you do today. Thank you. Oh, Sister America Menjo, karibu sana. May the Lord bless you for joining us. 
and I believe that all the grace that has been in this altar, you have received it. So blessed be the name of the Lord. Thank you, beloved. Wherever you have come in from, we love you, we appreciate you, and we thank God for you. I'll be seeing you tomorrow, and I wish you all the best in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Sister Beth King, the cursor is pointing on your name. You are blessed. <laughs> God bless you. Uh, I'll see you uh, as we continue on the as the second way to tap into the power tomorrow. Bye for now. <laughs>